from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today has been provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. Connecting West Virginia families and businesses through high-speed Internet services. Learn more about connecting at Frontier.com. At the legislature today, the Senate gets into a heated debate about where broadband should go. To the communities that don't have it yet, or the communities that need it more. And a special report tonight about the advocacy organizations in the state that assist victims of crime, adults and children. And the governor must decide if Medicaid will be expanded to provide health insurance to more citizens. We'll find out more about it on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. The state will officially undergo a public education overhaul after a ceremony at the Capitol today, where Governor Tomlin signed Senate Bill 359 into law. Lawmakers, union leaders, and members of the business community were all on hand as Governor Tomlin signed the education reform bill. The bill, which was hotly debated in closed-door meetings earlier in the session, was passed through the Senate in just over 30 days, with less than a week of consideration by the House. The bill hopes to raise student achievement by giving local school boards more flexibility when setting school calendars and teacher hiring, expanding the full-day pre-K program, ensuring all children read on grade level by the third grade, and make sure high school graduates have a seamless entry into either college or job training. This bill is a huge step in the right direction, but I want to emphasize that it's just the beginning. We have more changes to make, and we've already started on some. Through my newly established Governor's Commission on Middle Grades, we will work to better meet the needs of our middle school students. And just last week, I reestablished the West Virginia Workforce Planning Council to better align classroom learning with workplace needs. Both the Commission on Middle Grades and the Workforce Planning Council were established through executive order. The governor says he's also working closely with the State Board of Education to provide more technology for state classrooms. As the last week of the first regular session of the 81st legislature rolls along, the House Delegates is passing and fine-tuning bills from the Senate. As Dave Mistich reports, some bills have been left alone, while others have been dramatically amended. The House passed seven bills during the morning floor session, including Senate Bill 158, also known as the Complete Streets Act. House Government Organization Chair Jim Morgan explained the bill on the floor. This bill encourages the division of highways to use the latest and best designed standards as they apply to bicycle, pedestrian, transit, and highway facilities. During the committee meeting, there was questions concerning the support of the Department of Highways. I've distributed a letter this morning that is on your desk that indicates they certainly support the adoption of this bill. It allows the Division of Highways may provide assistance to and coordinate with regional and local agencies in developing and implementing complementary complete streets policies. The bill provides exceptions relating to instances where accommodations of all users of a transportation facility need not be considered in the planning, design, construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, maintenance, or operation of any state, county, or local transportation facility. Senate Bill 158 passed, 92 to 7. It was then on to Senate Bill 435, which would extend and expand the Home Rule Pilot Program. After three amendments from Delegate Kelly Sabonia of Cabell County were approved, Delegate Patrick Lane of Kanawha County offered an amendment to Senate Bill 435, whose provisions were already familiar to members of the House. With only one slight exception, Lane's amendment to the Home Rule Bill was essentially the same as House Bill 2760. That bill passed the House but failed in the Senate and would essentially take away the power of municipalities to create gun ordinances on their own. Ladies and gentlemen, the amendment would um, add as an additional eligibility requirement the provisions of House Bill 2760, which was passed out of the House 94 to 4, uh, which deals with um, the grandfathered um, uh, gun regulations. 
Uh, I would note that uh, in an effort to overcome some objections to the amendment, I've actually added a proviso that uh, allows um, municipal, uh, municipalities to regulate uh, the carry of firearms uh, in municipal buildings for government operations. So for example, a uh, municipal building that operates a municipal court or their town hall or those sorts of things, um, under the amendment before us, uh, they would still have the ability to prevent someone from carrying in those situations. After the amendment was supported by Delegate Morgan, Lane's amendment passed overwhelmingly on a voice vote. Senate Bill 435 advances to third reading. If passed by the House tomorrow, the Senate will have an opportunity to consider Lane's amendment. For the legislature today, I'm Dave Mistich in the House of Delegates. Buckle up for safety. The bill to make failure to wear a seat belt in a moving vehicle a primary offense is now on its way to Governor Tomlin for his signature. Ashton Mara has that story and other Senate news today. There were a few unexpected surprises from the Senate this morning as the first of their two sessions today started with the consideration of a bill familiar with the spotlight. Engrossed committee substitute for House Bill 2108. The bill makes the failure to wear a seatbelt a primary offense. It was hotly debated in the House and narrowly passed 55 to 44. The Senate Judiciary Committee heard even more discussion during a meeting last week, but on the floor. Question for the Senate is, shall the bill pass? All in favor, vote aye. Those opposed, vote no. The clerk prepare the voting machine. There was no such debate. The bill, however, did not pass unanimously, as we often see from the upper chamber. The vote was 24 to 10. Five other bills were passed by the Senate unanimously this morning, including one to eliminate duplicative reporting on distributors of imported cigarettes, aligning the state with federal guidelines. As the senators moved on to consider bills on second reading or bills in the amendment stage, it was a piece of broadband legislation that became the focus, House Bill 2979. Senator Herb Snyder explained the amendment from the Committee on Government Organization. So what uh, the Government Organization Committee did was to amend in the federal standards that were not arbitrary numbers that clearly will change, uh, is whatever the, the federal standard is for broadband, that's what we will be in West Virginia. But Senator Bob Plymel Senator moved to amend Plymel the committee's amendment, adding language that as federal grants come in to expand broadband access, the highest needs areas receive the expansion first. But it was the definition of those high needs areas that concerned some. Snyder rose against the amendment, saying the 15-member broadband council is charged with determining which projects to fund. The number one priority for that this current grant cycle that the money's available and they're giving out is to serve non-served areas. So we wouldn't need this amendment to, because the Broadband Council realized that was a priority. Clearly that was a priority. But someday we won't have that as a priority, hopefully. This amendment would tie their hands into the future for some potential future grant money if it ever comes. I believe that the Broadband Council made a good decision in their first $5 million grant cycle to put it into unserved areas. But I don't want to tie their hands because that 15 members uses many factors, many factors, Mr. President, when they look at setting the criteria for those individual grants as they should. Senator that, Mitch Carmichael rose uh, in support of the amendment. So it's entirely appropriate to use taxpayer dollars to help assist those people get broadband service, get on the information superhighway, rather than upgrading those who are already on it. As well as Senator Bob what Williams. Does, at the end of the amendment, it says that funding for the projects in these areas with existing broadband service below the minimum speeds, there's not going to be any, they're not, the, the, the Broadband Council will have to give priority to people who have no service before they give priority to people who have, who are classed as unserved but may have speeds at, at three megabytes or two megabytes or some other speed. So uh, this, this amendment will simply make it clear that priority for funding goes to those people who do not have any service. And I, I support the amendment. Uh, Plymouth closed the debate again defending his amendment. We are the policy-making body. The policy-making body does set priorities on what should be looked at. 
we, if you're going to compete in this world today, you have to have access. Access has to be the number one item. This amendment to the amendment allows that access to be the priority. A voice vote was taken. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? but was determined to be too close, and senators were asked to stand if they chose to support the amendment. Plymouth's amendment was adopted with 22 senators supporting, and the amended bill was advanced to third reading. It will be put to a vote tomorrow. For the legislature today, I'm Ashton Mara in the Senate. The final Senate Energy, Industry and Mining Committee meeting at this session had senators debating four House bills including one that sparked discussion about the future of the state's role in the energy industry. The committee quickly passed three bills, including compensation for members of the Mine Safety Technology Task Force, tax credits for coal companies with approved methane monitoring equipment, and regulation for the spacing between horizontal wells. But it was a proposed tax credit for state energy companies that received the most attention. Bill Rainey of the West Virginia Coal Association testified those companies use 32 million tons of coal per year, but only about half of that is actually mined in the state. House Bill 3072 sets the amount of coal used in 2012 as the base year. An additional tonnage consumed by the plants on top of that base amount in subsequent years is eligible for a tax credit of $3 per ton. Rainey says the hope is it'll be an incentive for energy companies to use more West Virginia coal. And Senator Art Kirkendall agreed. The demand for coal is, is at an all-time high worldwide. Yes, it's just the fact of the matter is it's not Appalachian coal. That's exactly and right. And that's where it's imperative that people like us have to be very creative. We have to figure out a way to be in the game, in the ballpark. How do we make, this is still the primary source of, of revenue for the state of West Virginia. Yes, sir. And the jobs and everything else. So we got to find a way to be competitive. And Committee Chair Senator Doug Facemeyer announced at the end of the meeting plans to study the state's future as an energy producer, not only through coal, but also natural gas. Several statewide nonprofit agencies were on hand to advocate on behalf of the abused and injured. Suzanne Higgins reports on Crime Victims Day at the Capitol today. Statistics say one out of four girls and one out of six boys in West Virginia will be sexually abused by the time they're 18. That's the third highest rate in the country. The director of the West Virginia Child Advocacy Network, Emily Laird, says we all have a role to play in protecting our children and praises the legislature for delivering on their responsibilities. We actually have great laws, I think, in protecting children in this state. Um, really progressive laws, appropriate laws. The, oftentimes the issue is not so much the law itself, but how it comes to, to work in a local community. So even though we have great sentencing laws, for example, um, what we find is that you need the law enforcement officer that knows how to investigate the case. You need the prosecutor that has the tools to be able to prosecute the case. Laird says Senate Bill 461, now in the House, has been her priority and can still make it through this session. The bill establishes the procedure and safeguards to be used when taking testimony of a child witness and permits a court in certain instances to permit a child witness to give testimony by closed circuit television. It's protections for kids when they interface with the court system. Um, Court is definitely an intimidating environment, and if you think about the dynamics that kids experience where alleged a perpetrator may be a caregiver to them, or it may be someone who has, um, you know, threatened them, uh, that can be really hard for children. So there are legally and constitutionally permissible things that you can do that are actually in, you know, federal code to make court an environment in which a child can most truthfully tell their account of what has happened to them. The West Virginia Child Advocacy Network joined the West Virginia Division of Corrections and several other agencies and organizations for Crime Victims Day to inform the public of the services available to victims and their families. Advocates of domestic violence victims said the problem is broader than many understand. Domestic violence is very widespread in West Virginia and um, we, we have a lot of programs to help female victims of domestic violence, but the underserved 
population, that being male victims of domestic violence, I, I fear that we're not reaching them, we're not reaching out to them enough. A lot of them are not reporting, they're suffering in silence, and so we would like for everyone to come out, male, female, anybody who is a victim of domestic violence, regardless of their uh, gender, sexual orientation, come out and get some help. Don't suffer in silence because the problems, the trauma that they've gone through, it's not going to just go away on its own. The West Virginia Crime Victims Compensation Fund was also at the legislature answering questions and disseminating information. The fund provides financial assistance to anyone who has been a victim of a violent personal injury crime in West Virginia. People don't ask to be placed in these situations of becoming a victim and we are the only financial entity that exists with regards to being able to help individuals that find themselves in this position. We're the only ones that can help them financially. And um, it means the world to people because not only are they a victim and have to deal with all the ramifications of that, but then they have all these bills that are mounting against them and they've got collection agencies calling them and every bit, everything is coming down on them. So we oftentimes get very positive feedback on how much it has meant to them to have those financial burdens lifted from their shoulders when our program has been able to step in and help and pay these bills that they've suffered because of their victimization. The West Virginia Crime Victims Compensation Fund is funded by fines assessed to every misdemeanor and felony crime committed in the state. 935 claims were filed last year. The fund distributed more than $2 million in compensation to victims. For the legislature today, I'm Suzanne Higgins at the Capitol. In a moment, some governors have and some governors won't expand Medicaid. We'll talk with some advocates who want Governor Tomlin to sign on. First, here's a look at what's coming up in the Senate tomorrow. Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, House Bill 2497 requiring applicants for a real estate license to undergo a criminal background check, and House Bill 2979 relating to broadband development projects. Among the bills on second reading tomorrow, House Bill 2046 to require cell phone companies to release location information of a missing person's cell phone when asked to do so by law enforcement. House Bill 2357, relating to the development of an educational diversion program by the Supreme Court for minors engaged in delinquent offenses associated with sexting, the conveyance of explicit images via a wireless communications device. House Bill 2399 requires counties to establish livestock committees to handle complaints and investigations of livestock mistreatment. House Bill 2514, the governor's bill to lower the film industry tax credit from 27 to 21 percent. House Bill 2579, creating an implementation plan to establish state-specific selenium criteria in the state's waters as it relates to the coal mining industry. And House Bill 2866, increasing from 400 to 500 feet that a firearm can be discharged near a school or place of worship, and that homeowners or their authorized guests be allowed to discharge a weapon up to 500 feet from the dwelling. When the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Federal Affordable Care Act was constitutional, the justices made the expansion of Medicaid by the states optional. Some states have expanded the medical insurance program to more citizens, others have not. Governor Tomlin hasn't revealed what West Virginia will do about Medicaid expansion. Our guests tonight are encouraging him to do so. Renata Poor is a health policy specialist with the West Virginians for Affordable Care. And Perry Bryant is the director of West Virginians for Affordable Health Care. Welcome to you both. Glad you're Thank here. You. Glad to be here. State your case. Why should the governor expand Medicaid? Beth, uh, if the governor expands Medicaid, 120,000 West Virginians and maybe more will have affordable health care coverage. These are people who are hardworking West Virginians who have jobs that don't provide health coverage. Mm -hmm. They are jobs in the service industry, primarily in the service industry, uh, people who wait on tables who work in the fast food industry, and they don't have health coverage. Mm -hmm. um, Having health coverage, we know, is very important for the health of West Virginians in general. We'll have a healthier population. 
better workers if mm -hmm. people have health coverage. Mm -hmm. We know that every week a few people die because they don't have health coverage and our health is probably much worse because people are not getting the care they need. Perry Bryant, state your case. Why should this be expanded? Well, Renat is exactly right. That, that being uninsured is more than an inconvenience. It's uh, uh, been stated that the uninsured live sicker and die earlier than uh, those of us with insurance. Uh, matter of fact, the prestigious Institute of Medicine estimated that 18,000 Americans prematurely die each year because they lack health insurance. That gets translated into four West Virginians will die this week because they lack health insurance. Next week, another four West Virginians will die because they lack health insurance. These are uh, men and women who die of undiagnosed and untreated hypertension. These are women who die of, uh, for lack of, of, of cervical cancer, for lack of pap smear. These are purely preventable diseases and we have an obligation to extend health insurance. Now, the governor's uh, required an actuarial study. We think that's the right thing to do to determine, look at all the costs and all the benefits. But one thing we know, before, even before the actuarial study comes back, is expanding health insurance, uh, the, the Medicaid expansion will save West Virginia lives. The governor was very worried about how this impacts the state budget. Now, the federal government has come up with a great scheme. Mm -hmm. Congress passed uh, the Affordable Care Act, which provides money for Medicaid for a limited period of time. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a scheme, Beth. This okay. is a, a state-federal partnership. Okay. For the first three years, the federal government provides all of the funding for this expansion. And thereafter, the federal share begins to decline, but it never falls below 90%. Mm -hmm. So in the future, West Virginia will have to pay 10% of this. But we think that it's going to pay for itself because we'll have a healthier population, we'll have more people working, the new federal money that flows into the state will create jobs. There was a study done recently by a national research organization that said in the first few years it would create 6,200, 6,200 new kind of jobs? jobs. What kind of new jobs? Uh, all kinds of jobs. Uh, jobs in the, in, in the, uh, uh, the nurses and doctors healthcare and others. Health, well, health care, but also, you know, hospitals may be, uh, uh, build additional wings to their hospital, creating uh, uh, construction jobs. And, mm. and those people who are employed in the hospitals, uh, they eat out uh, their restaurants, they buy cars, they buy houses, all those things. So it's a, there's a multiplier effect. It would infuse over $600 million in 2016 into our economy. So it, it produces jobs and it spur, spurs economic development. Governor will be here tomorrow night Great. and we'll ask him about that. Great. All Great. right, Perry we'll Bryant and Renata Poor, thank you so very much. Thank you, thank Beth. You, Beth. And here's a look at what's happening in the House tomorrow. Among the bills up for passage in the House tomorrow, Senate Bill 214 to clarify the requirements for obtaining a license to practice medicine and surgery or podiatry by making personal interviews of applicants optional at the discretion of the Board of Medicine. Senate Bill 445 to enhance state revenues by allowing the state tax commissioner to divert and use lottery prizes to pay the unpaid tax liabilities of lottery prize winners. Senate Bill 478, permitting employees at the Greenbrier to use the hotel's casino. And Senate Bill 504, to permit three or more persons producing agricultural products to form a profit or non-profit cooperative association. And Senate Bill 553, relating to the design-build program within the Division of Highways and making the pilot project permanent. Among the bills on second reading in the House tomorrow, Senate Bill 202, creating the Spay and Neuter Assistance Program in the Department of Agriculture to accept grants and donations to allow more animals to be spayed and neutered to reduce pet shelter populations and euthanasia rates. Senate Bill 355, the governor's bill relating to final wage payment of discharged employees. Senate Bill 371, the governor's bill to relieve prison overcrowding. Senate Bill 407 to require cellular and telephone companies to provide the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of its customers to the Bureau for Child Support Enforcement when requested. Senate Bill 437 regulating commercial dog breeding operations. Senate Bill 454 providing a framework for taxing alternative motor fuels. Senate Bill 464 regulating tanning facilities. Senate Bill 481 to clarify the process for voluntary commitment and transport of juveniles in need of mental mental health or addiction treatment and provide for payment of juvenile mental health treatment when the individual is not covered by insurance. Senate Bill 515 allowing vehicles to display GPS
GPS and mapping devices, and Senate Bill 663, creating the West Virginia Feed to Achieve Act to allow public-private partnerships provide a minimum of two free meals daily to elementary school students, with an eye toward eventually providing free school meals to all students. This has been the Legislature Today. Tomorrow, we'll begin to wrap up this session with a visit by Governor Tomlin for an overview of his agenda. On Friday, back to Legislative Basics, an overview of the session with our longtime legislative watcher, Tom Stevens. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today has been provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. Connecting West Virginia families and businesses through high-speed Internet services. Learn more about connecting at Frontier.com.